Hello, and thank you for joining us today for this OncLive peer exchange panel discussion on the topic of emerging concepts in the treatment of multiple myeloma. This program will feature world experts in the field and will focus on how to use the therapies we have available today, as well as emerging agents that are coming soon. We'll also discuss brand new data from ASCO 2015 and where the new study results fit into everyday practice. My name is Dr. Sagar Lonial, and I'm a professor and executive vice chair for the Department of Hematology and Medical Oncology and chief medical officer of the Winship Cancer Institute of Emory University in Atlanta. Participating today on our distinguished panel are Dr. Rafael Fonseca, professor of medicine and chair of the Department of Medicine at the Mayo Clinic in Arizona, Dr. Maury Gertz, chair of internal medicine at the Mayo Clinic and professor of medicine at Mayo Medical School in Rochester, Minnesota, Dr. Heather Landau, attending physician, Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, Division of Hematology, Oncology, and Assistant Professor of Medicine, Weill Cornell Medical College. Dr. Nupa Raji, an Associate Professor for the Department of Medicine at the Harvard Medical School and the Director of the Multiple Myeloma Program at Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston, Massachusetts. And Dr. Jayton Shaw, an Associate Professor for the Department of Lymphoma and Myeloma Division of Cancer Medicine at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston. Thanks to all of you for participating in this discussion. So let's start off talking a little bit about, I think, a class that many of us are really excited about in myeloma, and that's monoclonal antibodies. Where do you all think monoclonals are gonna eventually fit in? So this is our first meeting, uh, Sagar, where we actually have the data on these drugs, and um, you're going to be presenting, funny enough, on both monoclonal antibodies. Um, you know, the way I see monoclonal antibodies in myeloma, this is a, a antibody producing cancer, and yet we've never had a monoclonal antibody for this. We finally have a couple of them very advanced in their development. Uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about uh, uh, the eloquent uh, data, which has come out quite nicely, looking at elotuzumab in combination with uh, lenalidomide and dexamethasone. And this combination has certainly shown a higher response rate compared to lendex. And it has translated into a progression-free survival benefit of close to five months and a reduction or the risk of reduction of uh, uh, a progression by about 30% in patients with relapsed refractory myeloma. I think this is a new milestone in myeloma. And if you think about monoclonal antibodies, I think we can learn something from our lymphoma colleagues. You know, rituximab is generally slapped on to whatever backbone treatment they have. And the good news with monoclonal antibodies outside of the infusion-related reactions, and once we are able to manage those infusion-related reactions, we can actually piggyback these monoclonal antibodies on any kind of combination approach that we're using in myeloma. Okay. Maury, Jayton, Heather, any thoughts about how we're going to use it? Or what the data? I mean, you heard, you heard sort of the summary of Eloquent 2, which was improvement in progression-free survival, sure. improvement in overall response rate. How are you going to use that? So, you know, I think uh, the challenge that we have compared to our lymphoma colleagues um, is the fact that we have two monoclonals now that are coming out at the same time. So I think that's a challenge. You know, once rituxan came out, it improved overall survival, and that was a major step forward in the lymphoma field. Um, and so then you can kind of universally apply it. I think we have a little bit of a different opportunity and a challenge here where we have two essential monoclonal antibodies targeting SLAMF7 and then now CD38. Um, so I think the challenge is going to be how to combine the two and how do you move forward with the two um, and when do you use each one and how do you understand the biology of each one, uh, specifically when you're looking at elotuzumab and SLAMF7 and, you know, is it going to be targeting the NK cells and what, you know, can we identify patients who would have an intact NK cell function that may benefit the most. So uh, trying to identify those subsets of patients I think is going to be important. When we look at the daratumab experience, again, that will be presented later on at ASCO, uh, we have a phase two study with 104 patients that were treated uh, with daratumab, again, targeting CD38, which is ubiquitously expressed on myeloma cells. Uh, uh, and most of those patients were very heavily pretreated. They all had prior bortezomib and lenalidomide. Uh, majority of those patients had prior carfilzomib and pomalidomide as well. And we see a very nice response rate in this setting where we haven't seen really response rates of um, double digits as a single agent of 30%, close to 30%, um, with a duration of response of 7.4 months and the progression of free survival of 3.7 months. So I think that's really compelling data in this setting. 
where now we're able to show really single agent activity without dexamethasone um, at such high levels in a very heavily pretreated patient population. So I think that's very exciting data and I think it's going to change the field. And importantly, as we talked about before, as you move these active drugs in earlier lines of therapy, you're going to see even more activity. So I think this is really a, a, a very strong um, statement about the activity of daratumab. And you know what was really quite striking about the Dara data was in the median of five prior lines, there were actually stringent CRs seen. Um, yeah. You know, so in a, in a refractory patient population that's seen CAR and POM and all these other drugs, getting those CRs is certainly not what we're often used to. And especially as a single agent as well, mm -hmm. without dexamethasone, which sometimes clouds developments of other drugs. Okay. So what about other data combining LO with proteasome inhibitors? What do we know about that? So there is data being presented at this meeting, as you know, Sagar, and it's being combined with bortezomib. Uh, the good news is these monoclonal antibodies can be pretty much combined with any of the drugs that we have. So it was extremely well tolerated. And the combination of bortezomib, dexamethasone, elotuzumab also increased the progression-free survival. This was a phase two study, so a much smaller study uh, compared to the eloquent uh, one, which had 600 plus patients. But nonetheless, it did show a benefit in terms of a PFS, uh, suggesting that you can also combine it with a proteasome inhibitor going forward. Okay, and what do we know about the 38 targets in combinations as well. What, is that, what does that data look like? Ortezomib combinations, lenalidomide combinations, those things. As you, you spoke very nicely about the single agent response rate. We've seen some data in the last six months combining with the IMIDs and proteasome inhibitors as well. So I think we see very nice data, especially in combination with IMIDs, um, with both CD38s, um, uh, CD38 from Sanofi as well as the CD38 uh, with daratumab, uh, where we see very high response rates in patients. Uh, and interestingly enough, even in patients with Len refractory disease, we see a 40, almost a 50 percent response rate in that setting where we wouldn't expect, you know, such activity. Um, so I think there's some really intriguing data there, and especially in lens sensitive or naive patients, we see very high response rates uh, as well. So, so Maury, how do you think this the, avail the availability of monoclonals will change how we approach treatment from induction? consolidation, maintenance, post-transplant, salvage therapy. How, how are we going to do it? Yeah. Are we going to spend the next five years just proving that anything plus an antibody is not as good or is better than anything alone? We may spend the next 10 years doing <laughs> that, actually. Uh, again, here we have a completely non-cross-resistant class of compounds and exactly how it will fit into the induction, consolidation, and maintenance of patients with multiple myeloma is going to be the topic, and although it may sound haphazard to, quote, slap an antibody with a backbone triplet regimen, I think we have to go through those steps to demonstrate where it exerts the greatest role and benefit for our patients. The important thing, as Jayton emphasizes, that the toxicity when you added it to a proteasome really wasn't increased at all. Mm -hmm. And so in a way, it's a bit of a freebie mm -hmm. in terms of improving outcomes for the myeloma population. So what if I flip the paradigm, and I'm going to ask Heather and Raphael to respond to this, and say, we're not adding it to backbone. It is now the backbone. And anything else that comes <laughs> into it, it's a matter of how do you enhance the efficacy of an immune-based approach. Well, I, I think that we see from the eloquent data um, that the immune modulating agents are really important to be combining with uh, the antibody-based therapies. Mm -hmm. I, I think that although the um, bortezomib and uh, yellow-tuzumab combination is active, it's certainly not, uh, doesn't show the same activity as mm -hmm. uh, ELO plus lenalidomide. And so I, I think we have to be thoughtful about understanding NK function in our patients and um, when we're considering these immune-based therapy. And there's, there's even going to be other uh, immune-based therapy uh, that, that's being um, the, the PD-1 inhibitors, the, um, the, uh, all of the... Um, mm -hmm. The checkpoint inhibitors. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. will will uh, come into play okay. but we have to we we have patients who have I, I think that the other thing that we have to understand is in the uh, eloquent one uh, patient population these these aren't patients who 
who were lenalidomide refractory. Right. So in, in patients who are, have multiple lines of therapy, as we see in the daratumumab experience, the single agent is, is active, which is a lot different than the eloquent data, which shows a very high response rate, um, a very, very high, very nice activity in patients with a much more intact immune system, okay. if you will. Yeah, yeah. So, Rafaela is a stall def stalwart defender of cyclophosphamide. How does immunotherapy work with you? Well, it turns out cyclophosphamide is great for immunotherapy, as you well know in all the tumors. <laughs> but just to, you know, by the way, you don't always say smart things, but I think you were the one who coined the phrase that myeloma is the only disease that does not produce a monoclonal. And yet now we <laughs> have Oncologic irony. Exactly. And I, <laughs> so I, I do respect you for that. I, I'll, I'd like to say that there's two things that I think we should consider. I, I do envision monoclonals will quickly move to the front line because of all the aforementioned discussion regarding their, their uh, ability to com combine well with treatments. And I, I think one, and this is going to, again, reformulate how we think about our future clinical trials. I think they should go for the cure now. I think the combination of a monoclonal with a very active upfront regimen, perhaps with transplant, um, MRD negativity, long-term follow-up, overall survival should be key clinical trials to be developed in the future. And it's no surprise to anyone will see those, those trials coming forward. I think one interesting aspect which Heather just, just touched on was the, the um, uh, innate immune system of the person and, and how important that will be or not for this agents to be active. So for instance, Eloquent you know, shows us that the combination is very good. We knew it didn't work well as a single agent, but now shows clear clinical benefit. Does it matter if a patient is heavily pretreated with protosome inhibitors? We cause significant lymphopenia. We don't know that. In this clinical trials, patients were already previously treated with protosome inhibitors. But I think those are all going to be important considerations as we, you know, look into the future. You asked the question whether it is the backbone. I guess it's an issue of semantics, but at the very least, they'll be very important chaperones if they're not the backbone. <laughs> all right. So what else immunotherapy-wise is emerging that people are excited about? There, there may not be phase three data for things, but, you know, the, the whole world is excited about CAR T cells. Um, you know, there, there is at least a couple of different versions in myeloma that people are looking at, PD-1, PD-L1, other monoclonals in, in myeloma. What, what are people jazzed about? Well, I think chimeric antigen receptors, if the correct target can be developed, it really is very exciting. It's, again, a completely new avenue that we've never really touched before. That is very, very sparse. But the whole concept of chimeric antigen receptors, I think, is very, very exciting. We're going to follow that with a lot of interest. Okay. Jaden? So, I mean, I would add to that. I mean, I think that I agree. There's a lot of interesting with the concept of chimeric antigen receptors and then finding the right target and developing the right um, CAR T cell and CAR NK cell. Um, I think there's a lot of excitement around vaccine therapy as well as a potential approach. And we've been doing this for decades, but I think we're getting smarter and better at it. And I think there's some very nice science going on there. Uh, again, checkpoint inhibitors, I think, is going to be important um, as we move forward. Um, dendritic cells. Dendritic cells. So I think there's lots of exciting opportunities as we move forward um, in, a, in the world of immunotherapy.